So today what we will be talking about is the principles of 2D and 3D radiotherapy planning. And I'm only talking about photons on a LINAC and on a telecobalt. And why we're discussing this? Because many times you all do very fancy planning. The physicists are involved. Someone will do the imaging. The consultant decides what kind of radiotherapy is to be given. Imaging is done. Contouring is done. Planning is done by uh, physicists and uh, radiation oncologists. It is being executed. You all see everything, but sometimes the basic aspects as trainees in radiation oncology you have not understood. So I will try to emphasize on that. So I think once a decision has been taken uh, in the clinical by the clinical team to give external beam radiotherapy, then uh, it is either palliative radiotherapy or a curative radiotherapy. So what are considerations in a palliative radiotherapy is whether sometimes it could be high dose or a low and medium dose because your subsequent planning will depend on that. And I mean, I've used a EQD2 of say up to 40 grain, 20 fractions uh, as considering as high dose or low dose because even if it is palliative radiotherapy, but if you're giving higher dose, you may have to use more uh, stringent planning methods to reduce the dose to the normal tissues. What is the patient's life expectancy? What are the other competing can, uh, cancer or health related problems, logistics, the site that you have to irradiate and what are the organs at risk that will come? And also the expected lay acute and subacute toxicity, which will cause a problem and when you can manage that. And if you expect that patient is going to survive, say, for more than a year or so, then late toxicities. And of course, when you're giving a curative radiotherapy, then age is very important, whether you're treating a growing child or an elderly person with comorbidities, what is the dose fractionation you use? It should be evidence-based, the site to be irradiated, the organs at risk. Very important, the body reserve and the organ and the body reserve. And again, the acute and late, the late side effects with a given dose for different volumes of uh, uh, normal tissue. So the <clears throat> technique and the planning complexity is based on, so because a lot of things that before I go into the 2D and 3D planning, so one is the patient anatomy, and which is not just the body size, the shape of the body of that region of interest, the internal organ, the target volume, they come in different sizes, shapes and location within the body and how they relate to the normal tissues. What is the total equivalent dose you want to give, high dose or low dose, whether you want to use high dose per fraction. Again, you would have, you could have to be think of the double trouble and triple trouble. Then what are the acute expected uh, late acute and subacute and late toxicities. Then very importantly, we cannot ignore what is the planning time, treatment, planning time, treatment time, human resources and money that could be justified for the radiotherapy course in that patient within with the above consideration. So you may have a child with a curable cancer and which is located in a difficult situation, uh, position within the body, where you have to not only control the dose to the surrounding healthy organs in the vicinity, but also the integral dose, the planning goals and complexity will be very different as opposed to a palliative radiotherapy you are doing for an elderly man uh, with has a very low uh, short life expectancy. So I've just broadly divided simple 2D and 3D planning. So 3D planning need not be very complex, but sometimes very complex. So mostly it is done uh, simple 2D and 3D planning uh, is done in uh, palliative treatment, sometimes also in curative treatment. If complex treatment is not useful and increases the in integral dose, positioning and immobilization is kept simple. Planning is done with a wider margin, uh, <clears throat> both uh, uh, basically CTV to PTV margin uh, and it is done either on CT simulation. Many departments don't have an X-ray simulator, but if you have an you know, X-ray simulator, many 2D and 3D plannings can be done on uh, X-ray simulator. Sometimes even that is not there. Uh, you could use a diagnostic CT and radiological anatomy and in some situations, even on surface anatomy and skin marks you know, combined with the radiological anatomy. Treatment is delivered on a cobalt. Uh, all, all, all cobalt machines have a shielding tray and a LINAC with or without a shielding tray or uh, MLC. So uh, if you want to put some shielding, you should be able to do that. And of course, a slot for wedge or a dynamic wedge. And treatment verification in 2D and 3D is either just by looking at the field or portal markings on skin with or without imaging. And compared to complex 3D CRT and MRT planning that I'm not going to discuss today, but obviously you require uh, 
many more things uh, and it is not only done in curative setting sometimes used also in palliative radiotherapy if it is a high dose and acute or late toxicities are a concern so very important know your patient your machine and the department so patient is the ability and logistics to maintain a reproducible treatment position and <clears throat> take a treatment uh, with the uh, you know least uh, morbid uh, interruptions due to toxicity or logistics what is the treatment intent the technique what are your gtv ctv ptv and organs and risk and that is individualized for that patient then the machines that you have in the department from which you can choose or you have for this patient available what are the beam types it is photons only or photons and electrons what are the energies what is the maximum and minimum field size every machine some machines may maximum field size may be different what is the how much extended ssd or tsd you could use and when it is required the machine type what are the type of jaws it has what are the type of mlcs the width of uh, leaf how many leaves are there if there is a shielding shielding tray what is the distance of the shielding tray from the source and also from the iso center the type of the couch you have you know if it is a carbon fiber or something that there which could come interfere with the beam which is coming uh, through the couch what is the tolerance in terms of weight how heavy patient can come on that what kind of couch sag you get this is not so important in 2d and uh, uh, simple 3d crt but when you go to complex treatments very important <clears throat> what is the mechanical accuracy some machines would have much tighter accuracy what is the penumbra and divergence for different beams uh, of your machine and you should have the beam profile data of that particular machine then in the department what is the machine q and calibration and dosimetry practices you know some departments have been using little slightly different practices you should know that techniques that are commonly used in the department and less commonly and techniques that have never been used in the department so you may do a very fancy plan but if everyone in the chain is not familiar with the technique uh, it will be an issue in delivering that then the immobilization devices that you have and which you can use for this patient and what are the random and systematic setup errors with such uh, you know patient with this kind of patients so patient positioning and immobilization is very important and uh, it's a single fraction palliative treatment it is mostly the intra fraction movement whereas if it is a multi fraction uh, treatment then inter fraction intra fraction and also internal organ movement becomes more diff uh, difficult so the uh, the golden rule is use as comfortable which is generally a neutral position as possible so like supine neck is in the neutral position and supported arms by side heels together toes apart and you alter the neutral or the comfortable position only if it significantly helps the planning or delivery of rt maybe you remove something like a arm or a leg from the path of the beam you know in the entry or exit and uh, like head neck arms knees ankles they are well supported there are different ways of supporting uh, these things and most importantly patient is not in pain or physical or psychological distress otherwise you will have more of intra fraction movement and also uh, inter fraction movement and you should have that data of the department on random and systematic setup errors uh, and uh, with that kind of immobilization devices and whether the patient that you are planning is a typical patient or you expect greater uncertainty so the number of fields that you would use uh, uh, single or multiple the field arrangements the techniques shielding and wedges so single photon fields used most commonly in palliative treatment and some radical or adjuvant treatments as we will discuss later patient position is optimal for the beam entry and exit and organs in between so when you are deciding the patient position you have to decide okay what is my likely beam arrangement and that and then you should know the <clears throat> attenuation absorption and scatter of different energy photon beams and different body tissues so the body tissues are soft tissues lung air cavities and dense bones and sometimes you have a metal implant or some other thing so you should be aware of uh, what will happen how it will attenuate the beam how it will absorb the beam and uh, of course these are all compton effects so that absorption uh, does not vary uh, with the z it is only the electron density but you should be aware and very important skin toxicity you should be aware what are the factors that determine skin dose and toxicity skin dose is directly related to the toxicity choose the optimal energy 
highest possible energy is not always the best you may have a 20 mb photons or a 15 mb photons but for a given case as we will discuss later it is not optimal it is suboptimal and in specific cases use the beam with the least penumbra and divergence uh, you should know which are the cases where it matters and very important choose carefully choose the entry direction and exit of each beam ultimately uh, with the help of the logic of physics and anatomy decide the beam arrangement it will be parallel opposed anterior lateral posterior lateral oblique three field or four field and finally uh, shape the beams and modulate their intensity if clinically relevant so as we will uh, you know show so very important concept is the dose ratios so we always you look at sad or ssd technique the percentage depth dose or the uh, for the uh, uh, ssd technique and the tissue phantom ratio or the tissue max tissue maximum ratio for uh, sad or isocentric technique uh, so what are these concepts so basically the dose at any point let us say point x here compared to the point at the maximum dose it is uh, decided by the attenuation that means decrease intensity uh, uh, so attenuation uh, attenuation is because this depth d the greater the distance the beam travels within uh, a tissue water or anything else uh, the greater will be the attenuation and the, it depends on the depth inside the body uh, depth inside the body the beam travels what is the density of the material the photon energy whether you have used any wedges shielding tissue compensators or even tray so all those things you have to take into account and correct uh, for these things then scatter of the beam so dose at any point is not just because of whatever the dose you get from the primary source you also get scatter uh, beam so that will depend upon the energy of the beam the field size the larger the field size more is the scatter and the depth inside the tissue so the deeper you go more is the scatter Uh, and the what is the intervening material if suppose some wedges or, or, or tray is there which is very close to the surface you would have more scatter then the distance from the source this uh, uh, capital d which is uh, the inverse square law i think understanding this is very important because dose here a, at point x is not just because how deep it is from the maximum dose but how far it is away from the source and i think understanding this will help you understand what is the concept why uh, what decides the percentage depth dose so which is in the ssd techniques you use pdd and it uh, depends upon how much the beam has been attenuated inside the body or the material how much is the scatter at that particular point and how much is the distance uh, for, from the source which is the inverse square law and there is a complex formula for that i'm not putting it so it doesn't put you off but these are the three things really speaking so percentage depth dose depends upon i think i would suggest you all please have a notebook and keep writing so maximum the first and foremost it depends upon so please write then i will uh, talk about and uh, i will also keep seeing the uh, youtube channel in case uh, anyone wants to uh, you know uh, write in that uh, okay so it with increasing energy so higher energy higher is a percentage depth dose and the reason is because higher energy beams have less attenuation that is the main thing then increasing the field size how increasing the field size increases the uh, percentage depth dose it is because larger is the field more is the material from which the scatter happens and reaches at that point so uh, it is the field size because of scatter larger field size and source to surface distance so now this is many people if i ask so say what happens so they get really confused so when you ssd increases basically the ratio of this dose to this dose versus from here to here so the uh, the fall off the rapidity of the fall off of dose is less as you go further away from the beam because of the inverse square law so the contribution of <clears throat> this distance inverse square law is less when you have a higher ssd and then finally field shape circular is more uh, you get the highest percentage depth dose than square than rectangular and block rectangular because the distance from the central point where you are measuring the dose is least from everywhere in a circular uh, field and uh, highest when it's a long rectangular field and this concept of tissue maximum and tissue air ratio which is used in the in the isocentric technique 
so which takes into account the scatter and the attenuation but not the distance which is the inverse square law and the reason is because in the isocentric technique your isocenter you are always calculating at the isocenter whereas in the percentage depth dose your isocenter may be here is here at the uh, just above the d max so this does not take into account the uh, distance which is the inverse square law so basically uh, tissue maximum ratio it used to be called tissue wear ratio but now we call tissue phantom or tissue uh, maximum ratio because from the max d max from there to a particular depth so uh, this is increases so this is how you know and finally these are your uh, uh, percentage depth dose table uh, chart uh, curves as you see uh, say at 5 cm depth so what is important to remember you no one can remember at all the depths what will be the percentage depth dose but at least for cobalt some departments have completely stopped using cobalt so they may need not remember but historically it is still important to understand because it's a it is still a mega voltage but not that high energy so 6 mv and cobalt and 10 or 15 mv at least for these two three energies you all should know what is the dose at different depths So if you look at five centimeter depth uh, for a ten by ten field for cobalt, it is close to eighty percent. Okay, whereas for uh, a six mv field, it is close to eighty five percent, a little more than eighty five percent. And whereas for the ten mv beam, it is uh, over ninety percent. And as then eight centimeter also, you look at eight uh, centimeter for cobalt sixty, it is around sixty five percent for six uh, uh, mv beam, it is uh, between around seventy five percent. And uh, for a, a 10 mv beam, it is over 80 percent. Then at 10 centimeter, so at least, and this at 15 centimeter, you need to remember because towards the end uh, on the exit, you know, the, this is the dose that you would have. Or if you are using this, sometimes it is in the mid plane also. If you are using a four field box bilateral fields, for the lateral field, the interfield separation uh, in the pelvis region could easily be 30 or 35 centimeter. So at the mid plane, if you are using on a, a cobalt. You are only get, get giving 40 percent if the interfield separation is 30 centimeter. Whereas if you are using a 6 mv at the mid plane, you are get, giving around uh, you know 55 percent. Whereas if you are using 10 mv uh, at the mid plane, uh, uh, interfield separation of 30 centimeter, you are giving a dose close to 60 percent. Okay, and with 15 uh, with 15 mv slightly higher. So this also matters when you are using uh, fields with a large separation. Now the photon beam divergence it in, the increases with again I have asked this question many times and I don't know why people <clears throat> don't get it right and I'll use an example so please write for yourself what do you think uh, the photon beam divergence increases with uh, so sometimes it matters you want to have a less divergent beam okay many times it does not matter but sometimes it does matter so photon Beam divergence decreases with so this is something I have drawn. So you see, look at you are looking at divergence from here. This is a surface and this is at a particular depth, maybe five centimeter or ten centimeter. So this is thin surface is same. So the source is here or here or here or here. So what you are increasing is the SSD. So divergence decreases with SSD. So a lot of people I don't know why they so ask. They say divergence increases with SSD. No, it always decreases. And the example. i always use imagine you know when you do physics experiments you want to use parallel you know rays you use sun rays because sun rays are considered to be parallel and why they have pa considered parallel that means no divergence because they come from such a far distance so the ssd so source to uh, surface distance is so high that they almost completely lose their divergence they still have some divergence but uh, it is there so that with when you increase so a cobalt field on a 80 cm ssd will have more divergence as compared to a 100 cm uh, uh, tsd uh, linac field and if you increase the uh, for it further so extended tsd is 120 140 cm uh, you see the divergence will be even less now can divergence be completely eliminated from a clinically useful photon beam we are not talking of pencil beam for some other specific purpose so you can try but you can never eliminate divergence from the way currently the beams are generated from a linac or a telecobalt machine so when is a photon beam divergence of special concern so you should know that <coughs> you need not always 
run and do special things. So when it is of special concern is if <coughs> you're using multiple fields and you have a critical structure like brachial plexus or you have a spinal cord or sometimes uh, you have a, a sense a structure which has a low uh, threshold like a lens and the divergent beam you're treating one orbit from the right lateral and the divergent beam is uh, going through you have saved this lens on the right lens you have saved but the uh, opposite lens uh, the divergent beam goes uh, and fire so how to manage issues due to divergence so the one thing is uh, uh, not right now you are not use it uh, most departments will not use it but when you are resident you should do gap calculation so like you're using a mantle or inverted y basically two adjacent fields which is are in the same plane so this is for not for non coplanar field so this is for planar field so like so uh, dorsal spine and lumbar spine or cervical spine and dorsal spine because as i said you have to remember what is the maximum field size you have available uh, in your on the machine in your department and you should also know what is the ways to increase that available field size so the field size is given at the iso center the the what is the prescription iso center which will be in ssd technique it will be on the skin and in the sad technique or the tad technique it will be at the you know at that uh, field where your iso center is inside the body uh, uh, so but if you increase the ssd as i have shown if you uh, you know i'm not sure if you increase the ssd the field size available uh, on the surface will increase so there are ways sometimes 40 by 40 is not uh, adequate and you have to instead of using a matching field and you just had to be a 44 cm if you use 110 uh, cm ssd uh, instead of 100 cm you would have a 10% increase in the field length and you will get a 44 cm field but if suppose that also does not suffice if you are treating an adult uh, spine and you have to treat the entire spine like earlier we used to use for craniospinal radiation so uh, what happens at this point depth if you want to match the fields here then you basically matching the 50% i as a dose lines it inside it will overlap and that will get higher dose so if you uh, keep a gap on the surface then it will match at a depth which could be say 5 cm or just beyond the spinal cord and after that there will be so there will be underlap and overlap so this area this upper triangle will be underdose and the lower triangle would be slightly overdose so what is the distance so you have a complex formula separation so the separation on skin which is s is s1 plus s2 if you divide into 2 and uh, that will depend upon half of the length of this field which is half of l1 then d is the distance the depth at which you want to uh, fields to match actually and divided by the ssd which is this distance and same is for this thing now who can remember this formula but when we were resident we actually had to calculate when we were planning so it was not just some theoretical so on a piece of paper if you just draw because basically this triangle uh, these are two opposite triangles so the ratio of this ssd 1 to uh, half of l1 will be same of the ratio of s1 to this d so you can and you can calculate easily and if you take a pen and paper you may just use geometry so use a pen of paper use the same scale like i've used this uh, i've drawn it if you use 1 is to 10 scale like instead of 100 cm ssd you draw make 1 is to 10 that means 10 cm you will get almost right so separation <coughs> or gap on skin between adjacent fields if needed if you require then move junction to spread out the cold and hot regions of feathering you know like in csi we used to earlier move the junction so this area is getting under dose this get getting over dose so because you don't want all throughout the same thing to get so you can move it then half beam block uh, or asymmetric jaws uh, you know that uh, uh, earlier we used to use physical blocks these days we use there used to be a breast uh, cone which was half beam block to reduce the divergence into the lung uh, now we don't use those heavy uh, half beam uh, blocks but these days asymmetric jaws then mono isocentric technique if you are using a non coplanar field or even for coplanar fields and then uh, the other ways to use a couch twist uh, you know like you want to reduce the divergence make one border or collimation in non coplanar field like craniospinal radiation or even for 
breast and uh, chest wall and supra clap so you can give the couch twist by 4 or 5 degrees so you make the superior border uh, non divergent then if you increase the ssd you reduce the divergence so penumbra there are different uh, types of penumbra and the factors and relevance that you all should know so just so this is one is geometric penumbra because the source has a finite size it is not a point source it is not a pin head so this beam is from this point of the source this is coming here and from here it is also coming so this is the penumbra region here and this penumbra region here and as you see that if the source size is much smaller as in lenac as compared to cobalt just imagine this is a cobalt source 1.5 or 2 cm whereas this is a, a, a lenac source which is much smaller you see that penumbra of a lenac is much less uh, as compared to cobalt and this is also a transmission penumbra because the jaws and especially with mlc so mlc increases uh, this uh, of course it depends on the on the design of the uh, jaws or the mlc so some of them will move in a uh, uh, circle in the arc fashion which along with the uh, the divergence so you would have less of transmission penumbra and uh, so these are the factors so again you should know where it matters uh, penumbra then field shaping and uh, to shield the normal tissue so standard divergent and non divergent blocks are available which are generally 5 ml and uh, now they have limited use as corner blocks and mostly in app and sometimes lateral fields uh, they could be rectangular square triangular or a pencil block uh, for eye shielding could be custom made blocks made of ceraben some departments don't have those facilities now with the mlcs you don't require uh, and of course the best way in modern radiotherapy is to block with multi leaf collimators and sometimes just having a asymmetric jaw or just simple collimation itself will eliminate that normal tissue from there it is possible and uh, whenever you using a shielding tray you see that the distance between not just the ptv the between the shielding tray and uh, the sh shielding tray shield and the skin surface because if the distance is less than 15 20 cm then you will have high skin dose skin sparing effect i think before so uh, surface whenever you use a surface bolus sometimes the immobilization device acts like a bolus a skin fold acts like a self bolus when you have a lower energy so the dmax decreases uh, and as range of because the range of electrons is less and you sometimes forget there is a exit dose from the opposing field if your interfield separation is not large and if you use say 15 mv photons the exit dose is also quite significant remember that uh, percentage depth dose curve then when you have more higher field size so the uh, dmax decreases and the skin dose decreases because more of scatter oblique incidence many cases like in the tangential fields or in the limb or in the breast sometimes there is oblique incidence sometimes in the neck also so you have higher skin dose and then scattering from other material like shielding tray finally when we use single of uh, multiple photon fields what are the energy arrangements techniques and how you will modulate the beam is single field is only in palliative treatment uh, to spine sternum ribs and some large fungating tumors very few curative settings or adjuvant rt like orbit sometimes use in spine if you are not using other more advanced technique for craniospinal radiation in all other sites use at least two fields of sometimes up to four fields or even five fields for simple 2d and 3d conformal we rarely exceed more than four fields then it becomes more complex 3d conformal radiotherapy and before initiating the planning patient position you make sure it is optimal for the beam arrangement uh, and ensure the planning imaging uh, includes the entry and exit of the intended beams and the ctv ptv it is not just the region of interest also includes from where the beam will exit because before exiting the body it, you do not know it may be a sensitive tissue like uh, thyroid which may be going through and uh, it may have consequences where even low dose or it may be going through the lens uh, so you have if you are using a non coplanar fields then you have to see that your uh, the area that you have used for planning imaging is that much and decide if contrast will really help if it is not going to help in your gtv or oar delineation do not use then it has to really help really means significantly help then uh, what uh, uh, you know the factors that you take into account and you should be aware know the attenuation absorption and scatter of different energy photon beams in different body tissues so body tissues are soft tissues lung air cavities and dense bones 
be aware of the factors that determine the skin dose and toxicity and choose the optimal not the highest this i am actually repeating all that but this is very important now again in the planning process you have to be aware of that uh, use optimal energy have least penumbra and divergence and you know should know when you should be finicky about this uh, not always choose the entry direction and exit of each beam and use physics logic and shape the beam so this is very important and this looks very common sense but when you are actually placing beams sometimes you are not thinking of this so uh, so as i said carefully choose the entry direction and exit of the each beam you have to do it for each beam and when you are combining beam then some other consideration comes so it should have the shortest path through the body irradiates least amount of normal tissue before and after the uh, the target volume so uh, because unless until the target volume is from skin to skin you know from both sides then it's a different thing but if it is short of that then avoids critical organs like uh, spinal cord or kidney uh, so it is not in the path uh, i'm these are not absolutely rigid rules but you have to see whenever you can avoid avoid unusual anatomy suppose something is just suddenly bulging out so that will anything which will cause perturbation perturbation of the uh, dose avoid skin folds avoid area that will perturb the distribution and in multiple beams the intersection area is as small as possible and as conformal to the planning target volume as possible so this is very important when you use multiple beam and if this intersection area of two beams is much more than the ptv then you have to start think of okay to this intersection area because if the two beams everything in the intersection area is getting close to 95% dose unless until the inter field separation is too large we will show that so then you have to think okay let me add a third field and if again that is uh, large then maybe you have to add a fourth field and in simple uh, uh, 2d and 3d uh, crt we are not going beyond four field so i will limit my discussion up to four field so you know once you think of that so here i have drawn a, uh, this is i say let us look at the tumor in the skull and little bit of slight intracranial extension so what you could use so this is in the bone so would you use a direct so of course so if you remember all those factors i have said if you use a beam which is coming like this if you use a beam which is coming like this what will happen of course it will go through a lot of uh, normal tissue you know it will exit go through the brain so this is not acceptable if you put a beam like this then yes it will go through that but it is quite a distance so this posterior part of this uh, tumor uh, target volume will not get adequate dose so what you could do is you can use a uh, bi tangential fields that is one thing you know you could say why, why can't we use electrons we can use electrons but this is bone and the 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 anat and the, the in bones the electron dosimetry is very different so you have to use photons and if this was a scalp tumor then it's a different thing but this is a bone tumor now i have a tumor uh, say so let us say right frontal i will discuss this case in detail uh, later on so right frontal tumor again you have to see that with a single beam help if uh, so single beam will not help you have to use more than one field what will be the direction of those fields and then how you modulate those fields then this is in the center so if you use two fields then what will happen because all throughout if you are using two fields bilateral fields this area will which was unnecessary on the both sides of the of the target volume that will also get uh, radiation dose which is not really going to be of uh, you know unnecessary okay so now this is in the center again uh, whether you have to what kind of beam arrangement you have to use so though within and the skull i have used as an example now in this case uh, if you uh, use say bilateral fields then of course the some amount of uh, normal tissue is extra you are irradiating but not to that extent as you were seeing in the uh, previous case and i am not discussing the missing tissue so there is a missing tissue here if you look at the missing tissue uh, so missing tissue uh, because of missing tissue this area will get higher dose and you can reduce that dose by different methods and again so what i will do is i will now explain uh, the concept of a single field to a uh, single field which could be anterior or lateral or posterior whatever it is 
parallel opposed fields, which could be uh, anterior posterior, which could be bilateral, then anterior lateral fields, and then three fields and four field box. And because none of us can remember actually the the isodos lines. So what I have drawn is just a simplistic. So I've just drawn uh, anterior field. So 100%. So this is an anterior field and this is your uh, target volume in the pink. Uh, so 190, 80, 70, 65, 60. So of course, uh, the, uh, the, the distance between the different isodoses is not equidistance. As you go further, it will be going further. There will be great dis greater distance between 70 and 60 as compared to the distance between 190 and between 90 and 80. But just for representation for you to understand, I've drawn that and you can draw that. So in this, what will happen? So I've put this, the dose I've written say 95 in the center of between 190, it is 95, then 85, 70. So, so this would be acceptable or single photon field would be acceptable uh, only if coverage is adequate by either 95% if you are uh, treating a curative setting and in a palliative setting, sometimes 85 or even 80% coverage we ac accept. And then the homogeneity is there uh, within this. Then the dose beyond the PTV is acceptable or the best trade-off. Okay, sometimes, uh, you know, so that has to be acceptable. Suppose if I'm treating this and you have a lot of small bowel and it's a large field, a lot of small bowel and which will get a high dose and you can have acute toxicity. Even in a palliative setting, I have to really think about it. Okay, so that's why we've discussed mostly in palliative treatment and some curative techniques. So now uh, we have this anterior beam and you have added a posterior beam. So posterior beam here, it was 190, 80, 70 and uh, 60. Now it is going the other way around 190, 80, 70, and 60. So you have two fields, anterior and posterior, and this is your uh, target volume. Obviously, this was too large to be covered by an anterior field alone because uh, uh, this would have been grossly underdosed. The homogeneity, the dose gradient within the target volume with a single field would have been too large and unacceptable. And even if it was a palliative treatment, if you were treating through and through, it would have been unacceptable. So remember when the spine you treat with a palliative single posterior field, the spine is much closer to that field. It is most posteriorly. So anterior, anterior posterior separation may be 20 centimeter and your target volume depth is up to 5, 6, 7, 8 centimeter depending upon which uh, vertebra you are treating. So uh, if you can't remember this, so what I have added is, uh, so 95 I have taken an average of between 90 and 100. So this uh, gets from the AP field, it gets 95. Uh, anterior posterior field it gets 95 from the posterior field uh, posterior anterior field it gets 65 and in this area it gets uh, 65 from the anterior posterior field and 95 uh, from the uh, posterior anterior uh, field so again it gets 160 so if you look at i've just added numbers i've not converted them into percentages so if you look at basically every region in the parallel opposed field gets equal dose Okay. Now, this is just for a simplistic understanding that, you know, in a parallel opposed field, everything will get, if not exactly 100%, close to 95%. Provided, so you have homogeneous distribution if the interfield separation, which is between this distance to this distance, is not much higher than the photon energy because the attenuation or the percentage depth dose is decided by the photon energy, so that you have to take into account. And if uh, you have an interfield separation much higher than the photon energy for which it is ideal, you will have a hotspot anteriorly and posteriorly, which could be as low as 105%, could be as high as 120-25%. And you would have a constriction of 95% isodose. So I am showing it is not some people will draw, you know, like an hourglass, like you typically you see in an hourglass that it actually in the center, it almost comes to meet. It is not like that. It is more like a waste, W-A-I-S-T, waste, not uh, waste. So it is slight constriction. It is not a very high constriction. So, so what are the solutions, consequences of this and solutions and trade-offs? Uh, what are things? So, so consequences. So first is the hot spot so this is could be as thin slab it may be absent or it may be a thin slab of just one centimeter or could be up to three or four centimeter slab 
it could be for as low as 105 percent isodose could be as high as 120 125 percent and this will happen anterior and posteriorly and this will happen like if in a cobalt uh, beam you are using which is like equivalent dose is 1.25 uh, mb if your interfield separation is more than 18 or 20 up to 18 is also all right when you have 20 21 22 separation then you really this becomes an issue and if you have a 6 mb photon then your separation is really much more than 20 centimeter 23 24 26 then it becomes so and you know in olden days when we used only cobalt or 6 mb photons the very large separation we did not have high energy you would see a fibrosis anterior woody fibrosis and sometimes even in this posteriorly in the pelvis so you could increase the energy or you use a four field or a three field box so now second is the constriction of 95% uh, isodose again because of this uh, you may have under dosage uh, suppose you may have the nodes uh, laterally in the pelvic wall and they may get underdosed by not be covered by 95% but that doesn't mean they are not getting they might get 93% 92% so actually 90% isodose i will show later which is more or less straight so they, that area might get anywhere between 90 and 95% so the central constriction also could be much higher if your interfield separation is at 24 and you are using a cobalt 60 then you your the 95 percent isodose is coming four or five centimeter inside so it could be quite substantial it may not be trivial but if you are using say 10 mb photon the interfield separation is say 20 centimeter then there's hardly any uh, you know constriction so you could increase energy increase width of field or use uh, more than two fields but there are trade-offs when you increase width of field, more of normal tissue also gets irradiated. And when you use four field, then the other issues will come. So like this is an example of 6 MB APPA field. So, uh, you know, our trainees, uh, Tejashvi and Tessina, they made these uh, slides. I asked them, requested them, they gave. So you look at 95% is just slight constriction inside. But generally, in this case, it will not be, uh, in this, the AP separation was 18 centimeter. <laughs> and <laughs> there is no 110 person isodose here. But if you look at for a larger separation, this is on a, on a cobalt. Uh, you see there is a 110 person anterior and posteriorly as you were showing in that. But when you use high energy photons, like this is a, a 15 MB photons, you do not have that. And uh, the the anterior and posterior hotspots are not there. So this one again is with 6 MB, but you look at it, you have more of hotspot posteriorly, not anteriorly. If anyone can guess why it is there, because you see, so whenever you use parallel opposed, unless until there's a very specific reason, you prescribe at midpoint. So you see the prescription point here, it is there. So it is, so it is like a differential weightage you are giving in, in other ways. So you are, so this beam, your dose is prescribed, normalized at this point, much deeper. Say, let us say at 10 say, or 12 centimeters, whereas the anterior beam is at say 9 centimeters. So you get a larger hotspot uh, in this 110 percent. Now, <clears throat> this is a four field box. Rest, everything is taken care of, but you see a 110 percent isodose anteriorly. So can anyone guess or try to think? So this is anterior, posterior and bilateral fields. I mean, don't go into the beam arrangement why we have put so much here. You know, how does it help? But so the point is that why do you get a hot spot here anteriorly 110%? So you please note down. This is because there is missing tissue anteriorly because for the lateral beam. So it has, so the dose at any point, remember it is the distance from the source, the attenuation within the body. Uh, or the material and the third is a scatter so there is less attenuation so that's why the dose is more <coughs> so now i'm showing a different kind of field arrangement which again sometimes it is difficult to understand you know what why we get a hot spot so this is the anterior field and then you've added a lateral field okay so one anterior and one lateral field and you see also this uh, target volume is also lateralized so just imagine a maxillary antrum or some other uh, you know, uh, target volume. So what will happen? So again, I put the isodoses 190, 80, 70, 60 for the right lateral field and 100, 260 in this thing. So what will happen if you just add the 
number. So you have to predict where would be the hot area or the higher dose and where will be the cold or the lower dose. And this is uh, the dose is higher or lower as compared to the reference point, which is generally the center of the target volume or other or the ISO centers. These are sometimes in the planning, you don't normally use, uh, always use the ISO center, but uh, I think in terms of understanding the concept and planning using the ISO center for isocentric techniques is the best way because you your, uh, your TMR and TPR tables are calculated that way. So what would be the consequences, solutions and trade-offs? So where would it, so you all only think uh, where uh, on a pen and paper, just put where you think the hotspot will come and where you think the cold area will come. If you can't, you know, sometimes you can't think. So best is to write. So look at this corner, the upper left corner. So this is getting 95% from uh, uh, anterior beam and 95% from lateral beam. Compared to this lower outer corner, this is getting 65% from the anterior beam and 65% from the right lateral beam. So this gets the lowest dose and this gets the highest dose. And then it is a gradient. As you see, as you're moving from, uh, you know, right to left, the dose is decreasing. And you're as you're moving from anterior to posterior, dose is also decreasing. And so this corner gets the... So this area gets the highest dose from both the beams and this area gets, this corner gets the lowest dose from both the beams, okay? And so in a different way, any point in the target volume which is closest to both the beams will get the highest dose and furthest from both the beams will get the lowest dose. So this these areas will get a high dose, 180, 190, 170. And I'm just looking at this reference. So reference dose will be like say 160. And these areas will get a uh, low dose, cold area. So how do you, what you can do for this? So you can use a wedge. Would anterior wedge alone would help? So if you have put an anterior wedge, which is thick and uh, uh, thick and uh, uh, laterally, <coughs> what will happen then? It will reduce this, but not in the other axis. You can see the gradient is in both the axis. So when you use a, a wedge pair, anterior and uh, lateral wedge pair, then that is taken care of and you would get a, theoretically you would get a, uh, a good distribution. Now you have one anterior, one right lateral as we shown and you have added a opposite left lateral free. So this is a three free technique. So in a three free technique, so again, where will be the cold and hot spot? You can just <coughs> write with your, on a paper, just see whether you get it right or not. Uh, so. If you look at now, the dose is from three points. So this is also, this is going from left, right to left, left to right and anterior to posterior dose gradient is happening. So this point is getting 95% from the anterior field, 95% from the right lateral field, but from the left lateral field, it is getting only 65. So you get 255 here. And in this <clears throat> right lower corner, so, but everywhere, every box in this, uh, you know, uh, upper row, is getting 255 every box in the lower row is getting so the gradient is basically anterior to posterior just imagine right and left lateral are parallel opposed everything is getting same dose uh, throughout and then you have added the third anterior field and because the anterior field is contributing more dose anteriorly so you will see that the gradient is from anterior to posterior so what is the so these are the cold areas and these are hot areas and what could be the solution? Again, you think, uh, if suppose you have to use wedges, where, which beams you will put the wedges and what will be the direction of those wedges? Uh, <clears throat> if you're using, watching this on YouTube later, you should pause that, draw it for yourself and then you see whether you get it right. So if you have wedges in the lateral fields, anterior field will not help. Here only the lateral field and the thick end will be anterior. Now <clears throat> I'm using Okay, anterior field, posterior field, right lateral and left lateral. So this is your four field box. So where will be the hot spot and the cold spot for uh, four field box techniques? So again, you put it, uh, you know, if you calculate, basically, if you add whatever, with any area which is getting underdosed by one beam is getting compensated by the uh, opposite beam because it's basically the two parallel opposed pairs, right and left uh, parallel pairs, so bilateral and anterior posterior field. As a result, 
every region gets a homogeneous dose distribution in a four field box and I, as you will show later but then are there trade offs so this is an example of two field versus four field planning uh, so if you look at two field anterior posterior <clears throat> you're getting there's a central constriction slight central constriction which is on a cobalt and you have a hot spot anteriorly and posteriorly and uh, uh, if you use a four field box then uh, all that is uh, uh, taken care of uh, you get a nice distribution you are sparing tissues anteriorly and posteriorly and everything is covered but <clears throat> is there a trade-off when you use a four field box so what could be the trade-off again you all should write what could be the trade-off if you use a four field box so so this is what was there but imagine if you have an interfield separation lateral in the lateral field was interfield separation was 38 centimeter okay or 41 centimeter and if then there are hip joints so you are to reach remember even with 6 mv photons to reach at, at 15 centimeter depth or uh, 18 centimeter depth the dose whatever dose uh, compared to the d max the dose is only about 50 55 percent so the dose to the hip joints will be quite sub substantial and in some patients it may matter in an elderly woman with osteoporosis or some other and so there's a trade-off of it Okay, but most of the times it is not important, but sometimes there's a trade-off. So there's not there's no planning method which is ideal or perfect. And I'm not going into you know IMRT and uh, more complex techniques. We are limiting ourselves to simple concepts as to what will happen. So that is one thing. And then if you're treating on a cobalt, then you know, if you have seen these days, we rarely treat a patient with large lateral separation on a cobalt, but otherwise it comes so close to the shielding tray. If you're using wedges or if you're using this thing, it will come very close to the shielding tray. Uh, so you have to know the distance between the source and the shielding tray and the distance between the shielding tray and your isocenter. And if you're using an isocentric technique, so if you're using a SA, SA, SSD technique, that's a different thing. Then you look at this is a, a three field, which is rectum, which is on a cobalt versus a 6 mv no wedges have been used because in cobalt if you see this interfield separation is large you're getting much higher dose here laterally and on a cobalt on a 6 mv that is reduced but you're still getting anterior hot spots as we were showing in the three field technique so that can be taken care of by wedges to some extent okay so uh, in cobalt even if you have used wedges you have reduced uh, the uh, you know, by using wedges on the right side, there are wedges. You have improved the dosimetry to some extent at the, within the target volume, the anterior hotspot you have reduced, but laterally you have not reduced. And if you look at, there's a hotspot posteriorly. So some of you uh, should think and why you are getting a hotspot posteriorly. So there is increased transmission towards the thin end of the wedge. So you would get a hotspot there. Many times it is happening inside the in the soft tissue and it is of no consequences but so this is really clearly a suboptimal plan you should not use it but you look at the patient separation but sometimes in some centers and in our centers also once upon a time uh, when there was only one linac it had only six mb photons there was no choice so at least you should know what will be the consequences if you use a suboptimal beam energy for a patient uh, who has a large interfield separation so, so if you have used a four field, so again, cobalt, so that was a three field. Now we have used a fourth field you have added. So you have the lateral because you have distributed the field. So you have the lateral hotspot outside the target volumes are less, but still there is those in homogeneity, which is not there. And in the lateral fields, because of the missing tissues, we have added wedges. So now I will show this is like a, a target volume, which is a brain, let us say, right uh, front, frontal lesion. And uh, but as you go superior, inferiorly, the target volume shape is different. I think we will finish in uh, five minutes. Okay. So what will be the beam arrangement? And it will be SSD or SAD. So for this beam arrangement, remember what we have said: the beam has to travel the least distance, the entry and exit you have to choose. And uh, uh, the critical structures uh, should not, of course, I have not wrong critical structures. So you could ask, where are my critical structures? Let us consider every part of the brain as equally critical. Then later on, we will uh, introduce some other concepts. 
it should be ssd or sad so you don't get any advantage of using ssd you know there are very rare uh, i mean uh, situations where ssd has a real advantage you know when i said with the ssd uh, the percentage dev dose is little higher but that is so marginally higher that it is not clinically relevant so for reproducible setup and everything else sad is used so you use so then it could be so like i am showing example of and anterior posterior right lateral field with the isocentric sad technique so this is a right lateral field then this is a an anterior field and uh, what what will be the uh, so this is your isocenter uh, at depth uh, and of course you all have masters in implementing plans you all know that but where will be the hot region and cold region again you all just draw uh, where do you predict the hot area will come? So this is the anterior lateral fields, open fields. Okay, let us say six mb protons or a cobalt, uh, tele cobalt uh, beam also. So the hot areas will be anteriorly, as we were showing that uh, near the in, uh, which is closest to that. Now this is an issue. Sometimes you don't know how to project it in the sagittal. Where will be the anterior? It will be not just one point because all throughout. And the cold, and here it is, which is closest to the right lateral beam, and the cold area, which is on the uh, transfer section, which you see at the far end of the beam, which is furthest away from the, both the beams. And here it is posteriorly, and here uh, on the anterior field, as you, as you see, it is towards the opposite side of the right lateral beam. So, how do you take care of? You put wedges, just not wedge, wedge pair, as we've shown, if you use wedges. You take, you can improve the dose homogeneity. So this is a reasonable solution. So this is actual plan which uh, Tejeshvi sent to me. I requested him. So uh, uh, on the left side, which is open field, as you see this area anter anteriorly, anterior laterally, you are getting a hot area, and posterior laterally, uh, uh, you are getting uh, posterior medially, you are getting a under dose area. But as you use wedges, your distribution is improved. So this is what we were showing is. Uh, Actually, you can see that now, but that was only looking at the central slice. But as you go with the superior and the superior end and the inferior end, the target volume is much smaller. So you, although you have improved the dose distribution in the central plane, central axis, it looks much more quite conformal. And it so happened that the shape of the target volume was also like this, that <coughs> it matched quite well. But when you're going superiorly, inferiorly, or unnecessarily irradiating much more of normal tissue, and as I said, First, consider any part of brain which is not part of your target volume as a healthy, normal organ which has to be spared. You have to respect the uh, uh, brain. And uh, so that is getting unnecessary dose. Plus, on top of it, I have not drawn a, uh, a risk, a normal tissue which could even relatively lower dose could affect like the pituitary hypothalamic axis and the optic uh, chias. Imagine this is a child, this is an eight-year-old child, a 10-year-old child, hasn't had growth, hasn't had puberty. So all these things are important. So how in simple 3D CRT can you take care of that? It's not that before IMRT, we gave horrible late effects to everyone. So you could put a, uh, so, okay, so uh, this is uh, so normal tissues there. So you can put shield in the right lateral field. So now the question is, so, so part of the uh, pituitary hypothalamic axis which was coming in the field, I have shielded from the right lateral. And as you see, I have not shielded the uh, lower anterior uh, corner of the field because the, uh, because the shield has cannot be abutting or touching the target volume. If you do that, if you remember, <clears throat> there is penumbra and uh, there will be constriction of the 95% isodose. So you will be underdosing that. And if I give margin to the target volume, I mean, how little I will be shielding, basically just if eyebrow is a particular concern, you know, that I'll be just shielding. A, any shield which is very small serves very little purpose because after some depth, the shielding effect is gone because of the scatter contribution. You know, rest of the field is scattering. So, I, I mean, it doesn't really add much. <clears throat> and imagine if these are not <clears throat> customized shield. You know, uh, and these are actually marking and, you know, putting in the lateral field, more shields I put more. And anteriorly, because if you give margin to the, <coughs> the superior corner in the uh, <coughs> lateral field, because this is a, uh, the skull, I mean, so little of skull I will shield and again, it will have very marginal effect. Now, in the <coughs> anterior field, I am able to sh uh, shape all the corners. And, but if you look at it, my... Uh, 
pituitary hypothalamic axis is still getting some dose. So how can I improve it further? That can be improved because right now it is getting there only two fields and my half the dose is going from the anterior field and only a little bit of the pituitary hypothalamic axis and uh, optic chiasma have been able to shield. If I had used a third field bilateral, then two thirds of the dose uh, to the uh, this critical organ is from the two lateral field and I can shield that completely, almost completely. So only one third of the dose is getting from the anterior field and that too by the time it reaches uh, uh, this critical organ, it is also further attenuated. So you will, I will be able to get only about say 25% dose of the prescription dose. So these are the various ways to improve. Pres radiotherapy prescription, I'm just finishing this. The patient ID, what is the position and setup instruction, the site, whether left breast plus supraclav, total dose and dose per fraction, number of fractions, <clears throat> fractions per day and per week that you have to write, spell it out because many times you use unconventional fractionation. Type of radiation, it is photon and its energy like 6 mb photons. The number of fields and techniques like you write three field, biotangential, breast, 3D CRT and anterior supraclav field. Could be a monoisocentric technique. What is the prescription point? And you know, it used to be always universally in a mid plane, in a parallel opposed fields, it could be mid plane. And in a, in an isocentric field, it will always be at the isocenter. But these days, many plans are made where the reference point is moved. People feel very clever by moving the reference point. You know, I mean, you might move a reference point. Basically, you are just giving a differential weightage. Okay, that is all you are doing. We earlier used to use differential weightage. So you see what is your prescription point and just by altering the prescription point, are you really achieving something? So that you have to be carefully look at it, but you should be clear. This is the prescription point because when you look at the MUs and you, know, you should know what is your, uh, the MU. So when you're looking at that prescription at a particular uh, MU at a particular prescription point, you have to know that. And then special instructions. So I think with this, we will end here and uh, you all go back and uh, draw. This is to understand concepts. Most important, if you are using uh, photons, how many beams, single field or multiple fields, what should be the direction from where should it come? You know, it should uh, off face, it should come, you know, from the lateral side, from the anterior side. When do you use more than one fields? When do you use more than three fields? What happens when the fields are not parallel opposed? Even in parallel opposed fields, what could be the issues that could come when the interfield separation increases? You get hot spot, and then a slight constriction of the of the ninety five percent isodose uh, in the center. Uh, when do we use a three field? What are the issues with the three field? What when do you use four fields? What are the issues with the four field? And when only anterior lateral? When to use wedges? One thing I have not discussed is tissue compensators. Uh, there are some areas which you can use like in the neck where the contour is changing in a lot of uh, you know, directions. In coronal, in sagittal, in uh, uh, transverse section and all that. So just use of simple wedges will not suffice. If you're treating only small larynx field, use of wedges, thick and anterior would suffice for the missing and tissue anteriorly. But if you're using say uh, full uh, face and neck, uh, wedges uh, will not do the job. You may use tissue compensators. Uh, missing tissue we have not uh, discussed in detail uh, today. That will be uh, a separate class. This is just for the concepts. Go back, make your own uh, drawings. Do it again. Exercise. You, no one should ever get a wrong direction of wedges. No one. That is. I think if someone draws completely wrong direction of wedges, that means you have just not understood the concept. No, people have drawn, it actually happens and those are after a few years of training, the 95% isodose because they've read hourglass appearance. So hourglass, if you look at hourglass comes in the center, almost constrict. So they're doing, uh, you know, 95% isodose like that. So, you know, the beam energy, you know, the properties of different beams, you know, approximately what is the depth dose at 5 centimeter, 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter for a cobalt 60 field, for a 6 MV field, and 10 or 15 MV fields, and that is all you need to know. Uh, we have not covered electrons, that is for a different thing. Thank you very much.